Hello. Welcome to the AZO Color Edge Masterminds uh, webinar series. And uh, sorry about the little delay there. We just had a few little bits of homework we had to do before uh, going live here. But uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick so we can uh, do a little overview of what we're going to be talking about. My name is Kevin Burke. I'm the uh, Western U.S. Um, sales rep for Color Edge and FlexScan products at Azo, and I'm pleased to um, host our panel discussion uh, with some creative masterminds in uh, in the photography industry. Let me go ahead and show the slideshow. So um, this is our first of a new series of mastermind webinars that uh, we'll be doing with uh, different types of creative leaders um, who are also Azo Color Edge power users. And uh, today we're uh, focusing on photography and editing, um, but uh, we will also be highlighting creative leaders in different industries like print, um, animation, visual effects, as well as video post-production. So um, we'll have a few people lined up here over the next few months. And uh, we look forward to bringing those to you and hopefully it'll be educational for everybody. Um, our creative masterminds in photography today are Andre Duman, Michael Clark, and Sarah Silver. Um, we're focusing on uh, the photographers. Um, this is one of our top markets for our Color Edge products. And um, we're going to be talking about how uh, these creative masterminds are managing their businesses and their creativity as well in the middle of uh, the COVID shutdown and just the upheaval that we've all experienced since the start of this. Uh, Andre, Michael, and Sarah will provide their own uh, introductions in a moment, but a um, couple of things I just wanted to mention why we chose this panel. Um, these are creative leaders in what they do. So each of them is a leader in the, in the type of work that they do. And uh, they're constantly utilizing technology, not only to make their job easier, um, and more efficient, but also to explore new ways to use their creativity and, um, and kind of push the envelope of creativity. Also, each, has a, each of them has a unique perspective on managing in the middle of the COVID shutdowns, and uh, that will probably apply to many of you out there, not only as photographers, but just as people in general. I think this will be a, a pretty good learning experience. Um, some of the topics that we're going to cover um, beyond or after after this, uh, we'll also open it up to question and answers. But uh, we'll start with uh, some of these key topics: uh, the impact of social distancing on um, you know being on set, uh, communicating their vision remotely, um, also staying creative while you've got lots of extra time um, during the shutdown. Um, tips and tricks. So I know there's some tips and tricks in there and whether they've been you know, learned uh, over the last few months or they were learned a long time ago and have been applied over the last few months, either way. Uh, also, the importance of calibrated equipment. So since we're AZO, we're gonna be talking about calibrated monitors, I'm sure at some point, um, but that's, uh, that's also an important aspect here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Andre uh, for his intro and then uh, we'll move through each of our three panelists, and then we'll get into the uh, into the topics. Go ahead and stop sharing. Go ahead, Andre. Awesome. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for ISO for allowing us the opportunity to have this talk. Hi, Michael. Hi, Sarah. We've spoken before a few times, and Hello. I'm really excited to be uh, having this great discussion with you guys. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you can learn something along the way, and um, it's sort of fun as exciting as it can possibly be given uh, the crazy times that we live in. Um, so I'll make a really quick introduction. I'll just um, share my screen very quickly and briefly. Certainly don't want to make this um, particularly long, so we'll get through it as quickly as we can. So for me, I started out photography with a, lot of, a great deal of travel and aerial, and I've been very fortunate. I've traveled around the world to over 80 countries trying to really capture the unique locations and the beauties. Um, that is sort of off the beaten path. It's not sort of your regular type of photography. Um, and um, it's just been really an, an interesting experience now with the shutdown that I can't go anywhere. I can't travel. I'm really kind of getting the complete itch. 
to to go out there. I'm still able to do some aerial stuff that we'll, we're going to discuss through a little bit more. So getting into the aerials is still something that can be done during um, a lockdown. But my uh, my photography has also expanded and grown into a lot more product photography. So working with the likes of McLaren and Richard Mille, uh, as well as sort of taking on personal projects throughout the shutdown that have kind of kept my creativity going because I was pretty much losing my mind. I'm sure everyone's having a, a different way of doing it themselves. So um, in a very brief nutshell, you can, you can go on all of our websites. I'm sure there's going to be links to every, every that uh, section. So if you want to look at our work in greater detail, that's, um, that's where you find it. So that's, that's pretty much for me. Nice, short and quick. Over to you, Michael. I think, I think Michael's next. Yes. All right. Let me share my screen here real quick. Um, okay. And can everybody see my screen now? Yeah, we can. So, Gotcha. I am an adventure sports photographer based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Been working for 25 years. Uh, these days, I mostly shoot for advertising clients and commercial clients, um, Red Bull in this case for base jumping. And I started out as a climbing photographer, shooting mountaineering, rock climbing, pretty much anything you know to do in the climbing sphere, and then started branching out into all the different sports in the adventure space. Um, I pretty much melded two passions 25 years ago, basically my passion for the outdoors and photography. I'm not a surfer, but I do enjoy shooting giant waves. This is Piahi off the North shore of Maui. Um, so I shoot just about every adventure sport out there, but that has also brought me into the advertising sphere where I can shoot adventurous stuff. That's not necessarily an adventurous sport. Um, so just to give you guys a range of stuff, portraiture is still, you know, you need solid portraits. Let me move my cursor there. Um, but like last year, I shot with the Marine Special Forces. So a lot of the stuff's stuff where I need to repel or, you know, get into crazy positions to get the images. It's not necessarily all adventure sports these days. Um, but for me, you know, I've been using ASO monitors for the last 12, 13 years. Um, so they've just been a critical part of my workflow. And I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to make a comment as I was, you know, doing my homework on you. Um, one thing I, I kind of came to the realization of is that you get to kind of be three photographers in one when you go out and do uh, a shoot out in the middle of nowhere because yeah. you're, you're standing there at a while well, you're standing above this guy at the waterfall. Yeah. So not only do you get to yeah. take pictures of people doing really cool things, mm -hmm. but you get to take pictures of really cool places. And then you probably, because the people that you're working with are so interesting, you also get to shoot them uh, as a, you know, a, a portrait photographer mm -hmm. as well. So you, you get to, you get three different ways just from, you know, my kind of, you know, layman's, um, you know, view of it. Uh, I'm not a photographer, but um, I could see that that could really be, um, it makes you really versatile. And you also get to go to really cool places and then, gosh, I wish I was a photographer. <laughs> Well, anyway, I mean, but... <laughs> that's, that's part of the thing is everybody looks at my pictures and thinks I'm living like a permanent vacation. I, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, the reality is they don't see me schlepping around like six to 800 pounds of gear all over the planet. And then photography is such a small part of what I do. That's like 10%. 10 the rest of the time is just getting there and getting set up. You know, like this shot right here, we carried 600 pounds worth of gear lighting gear down to this location and i am also being shot at the same time on most of my big gigs these days the behind the scenes video is almost more important than what i'm doing i've been told by some clients so i'm on camera the whole time i'm shooting for most of my big assignments these days which is kind of a weird scenario um, but i do get to do a lot of adventure stuff um, but it's you know just like for all of us it's a lot of hard work on the back end to make it all happen. Yeah. Yeah. The schlepping, all that stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's over to you, Sarah. Oh, or fantastic. Sarah. All right. Well, here, let me share my screen. And here we go. Hello, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, and absolutely in awe of Michael and Andre and their work. Um, I am different. Um, in that I shoot primarily people and I'm a fashion, beauty, and dance motion director and photographer based out of New York City. 
Um, and also gift master, which may or may not be something that <laughs> people care about, um, except that I'm obsessed with it. So um, I shoot a lot of movement and motion. I started from a dance background. I was a failed ballerina. Um, and if anybody out there knows what it feels like to just be real bad at dance, um, I wanted to be um, on point shoes and I wanted to be on stage. And oh, you did, Kevin. Well. It, it didn't work out for me, but what did I'm work just a out? Bad dancer. I'm a bad dancer. <laughs> well, okay, then I won't. I won't take bad you dancer. out for that. But um, this, uh, you know, motion and movement comes into play in everything that I do, whether or not it's with beauty or if it's in fashion. Um, there's always a beautiful critical moment of capture that I find um, is just an ex exciting, inspiring moment for me. Um, whatever it is that I'm shooting. And every once in a while, I will get up and jump and do, I mean, okay, listen, I won't say that I got, we did test this, but I was the one behind the camera. So I had to put somebody else in the, in the, in the hot seat, but that was a very big mess. So don't try that at home. Um, <laughs> please, no, literally do not. We ruined, we ruined the studio. Um, all right, mm -hmm. back to you guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, and get into our first topic now, so. Um, my notes up. Each of you lives in a different state. Uh, we have New Mexico, California, and New York. Um, each of those states probably has different guidelines on what you need to do to protect yourself and protect the other people that you might be working with um, wherever you're going. And I, I know, Michael, you go all over the place. And actually, all three of you go all over the place. You don't just shoot, mm -hmm. you know, in, in where you live. Uh, but I mean, it starts with where you live, right? Um, but just considering that, you know, each, each state where you live and everywhere that you're going to be going has different guidelines, you kind of need to get up to speed on, on what that would be if you were going to go and, and do some work. Um, but considering those new guidelines and requirements um, for working in, in your states or in other states, how has that affected how you execute and, well, prepare and execute uh, a day on set? Uh, either on your own or uh, with a crew of people and possibly subjects that you're, um, you know, you're taking pictures of. And that's for any of you to go ahead and hop right in. Well, I mean, I'm going to start by um, opening up the idea that Michael and Andre, we love what we do, right? And given the, I, given the, given the pause that we all had to take, I think we've discussed different ways that we kind of tried new different things and just wanted to be as creative as possible during this 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 time right guys i mean sure. yeah you know yeah. um i mean andre you guys both of you guys were really impressing me with the 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 innovations and the ideas of like how to think different right not to use a tagline from something but you know how to how to really how to really open up our minds to making new work in new ways um i think well i think I think we all had that initial shock at the beginning of, oh my God, what's going to happen? How long is it going to last? How much, how closed is it? How long is it going to really take before we can even get to some sort of normality? And it's obviously taking a lot longer. So maybe initially we didn't necessarily have to think about changing our workflow. Maybe we're just kind of waiting. It's sort of like a waiting period, but clearly now, you know, for the last month or two, it's kind of really something that, we have to take really seriously. We can't do our regular shoots. You know, um, I did a shoot in downtown uh, Los Angeles where we closed down part, you know, some of the streets. And normally that would be a large crew, 15, 20 people. I had four. I had four people just because I wanted to keep, it was a conscious decision. Um, not necessarily this, I mean, the state had some rules on that, but it was just more, I, I wanted to protect uh, people that I work with and obviously myself, but it, everything is just on a smaller scale. And we're still trying to achieve the same sort of results. So I think, I think it's just in a you know human nature to try and adapt and, you know, live with what we're currently going through right now. I guess. Yeah, and I guess for me, I'm typically already socially distanced on most of my shoots because it is typically a small <laughs> crew. It depends because I, my work, like all of us, I'm sure, ranges from a really giant crew, you know, for the big advertising jobs where there could be 60 to 80 people on set. Those are rare for me. Usually it's me and an athlete and maybe an assistant or two. Um, and in some cases, a video crew out there. So it's already pretty small and we can stay pretty far apart because we're outside and we can wear masks. Um, and for me, I kind of saw this coming and I, I, 
in February. I don't have a background in physics and science. Um, so when I first heard about this in January, I started doing the math and realized this was going to get ugly fast and it wasn't going yeah. anywhere anytime yeah. soon. And so I expected minimum six months, but more likely a year that we'd be kind of offline to some degree. Um, and I was the guy in February in the grocery store buying like $300 worth of food. And everybody was looking at me like, what is You're your the reason problem? why there's no candy <laughs> left. Toilet, it was you that Wait a minute, it's you. It's you. <laughs> anyway. Michael. No, I, I, think, I think we're not going to get to any sort of normality for, you know, until at least, in my opinion, the middle of next year. Um, so whatever we're doing, whatever we're trying to do with our shoots and the way that we're trying to still remain creative but still be safe, it's, it's definitely something that's going to, stay with us if we want to continue creating so it's well, just yeah. it's just and navigating and everyone has a different i mean sarah you've got a you've got your own studio there that's a larger scale so everyone's i'm sure coming up with different ideas that are unique yeah. well i mean and also um i mean starting maybe about three or four years ago we implemented this um live sharing of screens working with clients because i have a lot of clients all over the yeah. world right and um i never felt I feel like I've been preparing, you know, Michael, you've been preparing by <laughs> buying all the toilet paper, but I've been preparing for remoting in with clients for a very long time. And so this idea that all of a sudden maybe we do it more often or we're doing it during set, um, you know, having, you know, having one ear with, uh, you know, one, one person and one ear with another. And, you know, it's almost like we're on like a permanent walkie talkie system now that is just a little bit more, uh, little bit more that sounds distracting uh, i would hate that <laughs> well you know the funny thing is i love it i say can um can somebody fly in uh you know i think she's looking shiny i don't have to yell somebody somebody miraculously comes in and goes doo, doo, and we're you know we're done or <laughs> i say connected. or i say is lunch here yet and everybody's like yeah i'm hungry too you know it, <laughs> i think that it's connected us in a really beautiful way all of the remote capabilities for shooting whether or not i'm shooting and i'm hitting the the shutter release button from New York, but we're shooting in some other city or just clients aren't there and we're all connected. Um, it created Maybe a you beautiful show way us to- your system. You, you wanna see my system? Well, yeah, cause you have the most right. complex of the three of us, I think at least. So this, well, actually what's really interesting is what I did during pandemic um, while we were in full on lockdown was creating shoots with um, models and teams that were nowhere near me. So, um, as you can see here, we had, um, I called it the black box of emotion, but really it's a big black, black out space, dubatine and B flats. <laughs> and oh my God, you see, I'm wearing a tank top. It was so warm in there. I mean, all these fans whirring from all the computers and we've got a monitor that I'm literally shooting the ASO as if it were the subject. So my model's looking at me, we're sharing her screen, we're shooting the ASO monitor. And then here on the left, that's cap one that everybody can see coming up. You can see, I mean, hairdressers showing the model how to do her hair, which is adorable. Oh my goodness. Um, wow. Model is doing, um, Helen's doing amazing things, um, playing with props. And I'm directing her in real time, we're all on a Zoom call. Um, and see everybody here. You can see everybody. Part of the, part of the, part of the Zoom is sitting there, listening in and interacting. Um, that's me with so many monitors. I think there's maybe two or three more monitors plus an iPhone, um, plus you know 19 <coughs> pairs of headphones as well. And shooting the screen. It was a. I have to tell you that um, you learn how to be a much better communicator. Um, yeah, I was, gonna, and, I was and, just about to say, because that's, there's a lot of juggling going on there. Oh my that's, God, it's a lot sounds... of, well, no, it got so meta that we couldn't figure out which I, you know, I was looking and I couldn't <laughs> tell where I was looking, but you know, the final results are beautiful and they're, they're actually um, incredibly filmic, um, um, very, I don't know, I was really proud that, um, I've done this a couple times with teams, we created these beautiful visuals and, um, you know, everybody says like, wow, we had a great day. And then we, we clap when we're done. And, you know, I really, that's been a lot of fun. Right. So just to understand the models somewhere else. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Model, everybody's somewhere else. And you're just photographing your screen at your studio. Thank you. Model is in New Jersey. Digital okay. tech is in 
New Jersey. Makeup is in Brooklyn, hair is in Manhattan. I am in the black box of mm -hmm. very, very, it's like, let's call it the sweat box. It was very warm. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and then I say, everybody take a lunch break and we stop for a second and then we, we pick right up where we left off. It was pretty wow. awesome, yeah. I, it, it, it is incredible to think, you know, the, the level that this has now gone to six months ago, we weren't even really dreaming that it would be to this degree. Yeah. Uh, you might have had, this would have been a complete one-off, I'd imagine, Sarah, for you to do something where everyone is so split up in oh different locations. But now, exactly. six months from now, this is probably going to be the norm. And it's how, you know, how long is this going to last? And even, even when everything is still okay, given the technology and the innovations that we're coming up with, how is that going to still continue to translate into what we're doing, even when the world is some, some, somewhat coming to regular programming, I guess. So it's, well, I think it's, it's a really interesting time because of that innovation. Exactly. It's an interesting time. And also this idea that maybe in many ways, you don't have to have everybody there for the whole right, time exactly. or in person. Yeah. You're still, and here's, here's the shift in dynamic. You're still there. You're just not there. I mean, your presence, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're paying attention. Possibly. I, I was talking to somebody who said they spend more time really focusing because there's nothing else distracting. Nobody's walking up around them. They're just you know, right. laser focused on what we're doing. And it wouldn't be possible without the eyes on monitors, right? No, Love that it. Is, well, <laughs> I mean, that, that's part of, that's, that's the whole part of the technology is, is exactly. to, get, yeah. to get that fidelity, right? Both color and yeah. the sharpness, so. And what consistency across all of them, right? My well, final like question on this is uh, kind of answered already, but there's a little bit more to it. <laughs> what, if anything, do you need to do different to ensure you end up with the quality you expect from yourself and from your team? Obviously, we can see what you're doing different. Um, but are you finding yourself, when you do this, with uh, are you being faced with compromise decisions? Like, I'm not really going to be able to get what I normally get by doing it this way. Have you, have you found, you, you being any of the three of you, uh, have you found that uh, when you you know, going into this time, um, are you finding that I'm not really sure I want to do that because I just might not be able to produce the kind of quality that I would have normally expected to do? Yeah, but I think maybe just embracing the difference, just going with it. Maybe it's not, maybe, maybe there are, um, you, you, you give a little and you take a little, but I mean, you embrace that and you say, well, like, pretty incredible that we can do what we do. I mean, you guys, Michael and, and you I, might you get guys different. Are, yeah, exactly. You might get different results that you weren't even expecting. That it can exactly. it can have a complete different look and feel. That again, you would have never really even thought about doing it that particular way. But you're kind of forced to do it. So let's run with it. And actually, that's that came out pretty good. I, exactly. I, I think it depends. I think to best answer your question, Kevin, I think it really depends on what what your subject really is. I think for Sarah, because you do uh, you do a great deal of portraits, that can be probably the most problematic to have so many people. I think you're probably the most maybe affected. I, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but uh, for me, you know, can, I struggle because, and I think I'm more related to, to, to Michael on this, we can't really travel to the degree that mm -hmm. we were used to. Uh, and clients obviously have, they're still spooked um, in terms of what's happening. And I think they're still in sort of like a waiting period to figure it, <laughs> really figure it out. So I'm lucky because I have a home studio. So I'm still able to continue to do, you know, experiment on, on lighting techniques or shooting a different product just, just in my own time. So I've had some client shoots, but I've never had to really share the screen. It's always been, let me shoot it. We're going to go back and forth through email or through Dropbox. You're lucky. Just, just, I, want, I, want, yeah. I want to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, but it, it depends again on the subject. I think, I think, I've, I've never had a client where they really had to be on set right there with me as I'm shooting and they wanted to see everything. We had a really detailed brief about what they wanted. And, and I think maybe they just looked at my work and knew the kind of quality that I can produce. And they, and I sort of ran with it, but it was just a constant back and forth. It just wasn't in real time. So for me, it hasn't, it's affected me from a travel perspective, but doing the stuff that I do in the studio, really, I, I don't think it would be necessarily any different than if everything was okay. Hmm. I don't know, for, Michael, are you probably in the same similar boat? Similar, um, you know, but let's be honest, for me at least, there's not like tons of assignments running around out there at the moment. They're right. few and far between. 
most of my clients in the adventure space, you know, this is the last type of imagery that really is needed right now. And there's a lot of it out there already. <laughs> I, I so, disagree. I think it's I mean, I, it's I needed for entertainment well. value maybe, but <laughs> they're not hiring people for assignments. So most of my clients are like, yeah, go out and shoot something and then we'll see if we want it later. And our, right. I'm a very diversified business to start with. You know, I, I, like a third of my work is probably stuff that I go shoot on personal projects and then license it after the fact. Um, and then a third of that is assignments. And then another third comes from speaking and fine art prints and workshops and all kinds of other stuff. So there's been definitely ways that I can keep working where I'm not shooting quote unquote an assignment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I happen to live in New Mexico, you know, in a very small city. So I, like Kevin said, you know, not being able to travel. For my images, as you saw in my intro, a lot of my work depends on the location and the background. And then an athlete or whoever I'm photographing is doing whatever they do in that location, like it is for all of us. But um, so, and I'm not jumping on planes anytime soon um, because of the risk factors with that. So I can drive within a few states of here, but also as Kevin was talking about, our state has pretty severe lockdown restrictions at the moment where it's 14 day quarantine uh, for those coming into our state and most of the states around us have quarantine laws for people traveling to those states so that makes it rather difficult yeah. to do an assignment because you gotta basically factor in a month of quarantine just to go shoot for a couple days yeah. or something mm -hmm. so i'm mostly staying at this moment within my state and hopefully once you know here in this country we take care of some of the issues we're dealing with and with covid and it you know dies down a little bit we can travel a little bit more throughout the West for me at least, and get to some other backgrounds. But New Mexico has some pretty epic backgrounds. Um, and then say, on set, I was yeah, gonna say, just, you, just live, in, you live in the ultimate. Andre and I are like, we're coming to visit. Yeah, come yeah. on out, yeah, that'd be <laughs> great. We, but we'll, 14 days and then, you know. Then yeah, we'll we don't have any surfing, you know, we, have, we don't have sea kayaking and stuff like that. So there's some stuff we don't uh, have. We do, but, well, I mean, have that. But anyway. like the national parks are just, from what I'm hearing, all the national parks are just flooded with people right now. It's just, uh, yeah. you know, I, I could go to Death Valley, I can go to Sequoia or, or wherever, and it's just everything that I'm hearing is just, it's completely packed. There's no real proper, proper social distancing, and you're still going to just meet people in restaurants and where you eat and where you stay. So for me, I'm, I'm just not ready to take that gamble yet. So yeah. I've made a switch. I still, finally, I still do some aerial work. Um, I have a good friend of mine that actually has his own plane, which is, which is nice. And even then it's the whole, not necessarily social distancing, but we leave the windows open. We, um, well, the doors open for me anyway, but I, you know, we're wearing a mask. The plane doors are open? Yeah. And the, the windows whole side are of open. The, plane, the whole side of the plane is you're, open. You're so strapped in though, right? Like you're dangling, yeah. but you're not going. Nice. All right. I'm, I'm sideways. I want to see BTS down. of this here. That's what I want. Oh God. It's, uh, it's. It's interesting, um, but you know that that at least has kept some of my travel sort of juices flowing, just to be able to get out the house because I've just mm -hmm. been really cooped up. Um, so that's been quite nice. But I don't know. I'm dying to go back to some of the places I've been already, or anywhere else really on my on my list that just keeps growing now and, uh, and it's getting delayed. So well, hopefully we'll get there. Totally. I was in Yosemite two weeks ago, and you yeah. had to get you have to get a day use pass even just to go in there for the day and to go home. Hmm. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And it's not crowded because they've cut off the amount of people that can come into the park. Wow. That's brilliant. Um, that's great. So, uh, maybe that's different yeah, from what I was hearing. You know, photogenic Yosemite is, uh, is still there um, for the taking and, and uh, you don't have to worry about crowds too much. Yes, everybody is getting out and, and going to these uh, out of the way places right now because they're kind of the only places you can get to by driving there. But um, some places like Yosemite are actually requiring you to make a reservation to even come into the park. But um, I did want to, uh, before I go on to the next question, uh, make sure that everybody knows uh, in the audience that We've got uh, a chat uh, section on the Zoom here. And if you've got any questions uh, for the panelists or for me, um, go ahead and put those questions in the chat. And we've got a team uh, going through and, um, and passing the, the most appropriate ones back to me for our Q&A session later.
And can huh. somebody put in my question, which is, Andre, do you ever get scared hanging out the plane? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer that one. I'm dying to know. We can do that offline. <laughs> I, I, love, I personally, it's my most freeing type of photography for me. It's, it's, um, I love being up in the air. I, I really genuinely, once I get up there, it just, I, I've never felt scared. I, the only time I feel scared, funnily enough, is because, I like to shoot straight down. So the, the plane is literally doing the whole corkscrew around, which can kind of play with your brain a little bit because all the blood's rushing. Yeah. But the only time, I never feel scared doing that. The only time I actually feel a little bit queasy is, or, or scared is when I actually take my eye away from the camera. And I realize at what crazy angle we're actually I'm going because sure. you just don't realize it. You don't realize how tight you really are. And literally, if I lean a little bit more, I am <laughs> definitely able to fall out if that safety belt comes off i am i'm dead <laughs> so it's um, understood you know, it's, it's a little bit awakening uh, in some ways but it's it's brilliantly fun if no one's done aerial before i highly recommend it no nope. doing it and i will I'll, do it I'll, have I'll, not done I'll it you would up. like to i'm i'm showing up and planes are much you up. safer than helicopters just to be clear helicopters are a lot scarier so so i've done that switch fun it's, <laughs> yeah. it's good you mentioned that because yeah hel helicopters provide some advantages that a plane just can't obviously it's yep. great that you can just hover every now and again um, um it's but distances obviously the plane is the way to go and it is it is more stable <clears throat> yes well, you can glide with a plane you can't glide with a helicopter and you know kevin <laughs> kevin this is an interesting point i'm i'm listening to michael and andre and we've talked about our work and maybe um maybe what is hard during this time is that the inspiration that you andre get from being in that plane and michael you hanging off the side of that cliff um that yeah. rush of excitement <clears throat> of catching your photograph and catching that moment, um, you don't get to be in that space. And I would say that the only difference between what you guys do and what I do is that my rush really comes from the collaboration with my team. And right. through a combination of you know, video conferencing and remote shooting and all of the ways, you know, I've worked with all these editors during the quarantine and I've talked to, I mean, I basically found any way to collaborate with it. I'm like, hey, you wanna collaborate? You wanna collaborate today? What are you doing today? You wanna collaborate? Um, and maybe, you know, that, that part of the effect, that, the, the excitement of being in your element in whatever it is that you do as a shooter um, is maybe that's been, that's been a hard thing to, uh, for you that's guys to That's a great point, kind of Sarah. For me, that, that's a stellar point that I haven't actually really thought about much until you just said that, is that, <laughs> I'm usually out there working with the, some of the best athletes on the planet, like doing the cutting, you know, things at the cutting edge. And that's one of the high points of my job is that I get to see this stuff. Somebody, you know, Kai Lenny surfing an 80 foot wave, you know, Rafa Ortiz going off a hundred foot waterfall or Alex Honnold or whoever it is, you know, climbing some incredible thing. Um, and I'm not necessarily getting to see that. I'm still working with local athletes who are incredible athletes, but they're not the world's best necessarily. Um, and we're also toning it down because we're not pushing the envelope as hard as we might because the hospital might be pretty full right now. We don't need to add to that <laughs> with an athlete taking risks. So a huge part of my job is risk analysis, not mine only, but also the athlete for my crew, for the athlete, um, for the client who doesn't want anybody to get injured. Um, and so that's a very interesting point. And that doesn't necessarily lower my creativity. It maybe makes me have to be more creative to get something more interesting. But I can just assume you've got some of the similar type issues, Andre. Yeah, but I still miss the rush of a multitude of things. I miss the rush of getting on a plane just to go somewhere. And that's that excitement of something that I've been researching for six months and I'm finally going to see it for myself. And I just can't, I can't, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't do that right now. But at the same time, I've, you know, my, my photography in the last few years has also shifted from travel and aerial, which I still do, but also more towards advertising commercial. So shooting, you know, I get the rush now from shooting the McLaren cars. I have a good relationship with McLaren as a client. Um, shooting a nine, two $9 million cars in a studio. Who doesn't is, get a rush from that? Come on, nine wait. $9 million <laughs> dollar cars? Wow. Wait a minute. Well, one, of them, one of them was 6.5 million and the other one was 
eight, five, whatever it was. It wow. was just close to $9 million and incredibly rare. There were only, I think, 30 made at the time. Um, so I get rushed from that. I get rushed from some of the clients that kind of put your faith in, in us as creators to be able to make something that's unique. There's a reason why mm -hmm. our clients have chosen us, right? Because they've seen our previous work or they believe in the vision that we have. Um, and, and again, maybe this is the best time to sort of bring it back to the technology that we use, you know, that because they, they trust us with that vision, we need to use the best equipment to be able to make that happen. Otherwise it's just not going to come through. We're going to miss something. We're going to, one of our color channels is going to be off and it's just going to look, not look the way that they want. So everything rolled up into it. Um, it's, um, we're relying more and more on technology to be able to make it happen. Um, yeah. so. That is most certainly. As we are right now. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we got Zoom, huh? exactly. Yeah. Um, changing, not changing the topic too much, but uh, sticking with this kind of working remotely with team members, um, probably mostly a, a Sarah question, but uh, mm -hmm. see, you know, how this works out. But um, when, when you're working remotely with, with team members, how are you communicating your vision to your team? And not necessarily um, just about the vision, but also uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts of uh, communicating as well. And I, I know Sarah had Sarah, a, you want to take this one? I <laughs> act things out a lot. I mean, I'm like, you know, I, you, I, nothing, you know, being a fervent communicator doesn't change with a Zoom call or, I mean, I, Picture this though, what's an interesting conundrum is that if I'm on a set and I'm wearing a mask um, and I love what the model is doing and I say, please smile, but she can't see me smile. I smile with the model. I move with the model. I wink with the model. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, I, I've, been, I've been shadow boxing with my, with my subjects for a very long time. So when I'm really excited about something, I say, you can't see my face. I'm happy. Like I'm, <laughs> and, and then everybody else who's on Zoom is saying, what's wrong with her? Um, boy, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> how do, how, for me to really um, impart these ideas and bring the teams together, it's a very sophisticated combination of screen share, video, I see you, you see me, me enacting um, lots of graphing. Um, we, but I think that the only difference in what we're doing is that we're not all sitting together, but I, like I said, I've been screen sharing to impart visuals to clients that aren't on in, in my time zone for a really long time. So I don't think for that, I don't think anything changed, you know. I would think by um, doing it remotely, that's gonna actually help you exactly to your point. The fact that you, know, you don't need to have a mask. You can, you can actually, show exactly your emotions so people can just get it a lot quicker rather than imagine if you're on set with 10 people that you have to social distance and you have to take your mask down every time it's it's just going to slow everything down in some ways this might actually be speeding it up given well, what's going when on. i am on set with people and we are social distancing i will you know and i'm i'm behind the mask and then we have a million because we have a million different cameras seeing all aspects of the shoot i'm like this is good i'm happy i like this you know like this is great you know i i think i started gesticulating a lot which is why i can't sit still on this call you know i'm like <laughs> no but you know what i think i think that's the other thing this is a very um it's a challenging time for everybody and so as leaders in the is as leaders in I always said that I feel like a camp counselor. And if you have enthusiasm, then everybody else will have enthusiasm. If you lead by example and you have positivity and you remind everybody that what they're doing, um, it's special. You know, thank you for giving yourself um, and your energy and your, your personality and, and your beauty inside and out for this you know, hour to 10 hours of however long we're working together. You know, find, and, just, and no. finding the humanity and the technology, right? Yeah, I think the most, I don't want to call it frustrating because it's obviously very important, but just constantly remind, put on your mask, you know, wash your hands, get some sanitizer. I mean, you're touching you touch should be stands, washing your hands anyways. Well, <laughs> you, you should, but now you'll, now you have to do the, you know, the hand sanitizer and everyone's touching C-stands and, and touching the monitors and, you know, there's different, you have to be, your, your mind changes, a little, you know, your mindset changes because it's, it's a lot more safety conscious and you and you know you as the sort of main person in charge you have to remind your assistants and everyone else to 
keep doing that, which I think that's been a big change for me. It's like every 10, 15 minutes or whatever, like, oh, someone took that mask off and they forgot to put it on. Like, hey, can you go do that? Let's be aware of everything else going on with every, you know, people on set. So, and that's why I want to keep them short. I mean, uh, small. I have maybe one or two assistants max. I really don't, especially for what I'm doing, I don't need a gigantic team. So like similar to what Michael's saying. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's, uh, hasn't massively changed, but again, it's just your mindset of being a lot more health conscious. Yeah. Well, I mean, and we've, we've compartmentalized everything. Everybody gets their own monitor. Everybody's got their own keyboard. Everybody's got their own, everybody's yeah. plugged in on their earphones. You know, these people only work in this area, you know, and we're all spread out. Um, um, and you know, you've never seen more monitors, keyboards, mice trays. I mean, it is, <laughs> it's, so funny. I'm like, which, wait, what monitor am I right now? Whoa. Who, okay. You're <laughs> here. And then, and they're all mirrored. So everybody's seeing the same thing. Um, yeah. And they're all color correct. Awesome. There you go. You had a, um, you had mentioned in the past about how you implemented a communication process with the people while you're actually doing, you know, while you're actually doing the work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, um, that communication when you're all remote, um, it's kind of come together with with what you're doing. You had a Meaning, all in response kind of. Oh uh, my God. Well, okay. It, and this is, this is the most amazing thing. Acknowledgement, call and response is the most important thing. Michael, I want you to, uh, I want you to um, pick up that on. ice. I, I mean, it, I, if I give, if I give a, if I give a request, I need to I hear I need to hear an acknowledgement that you heard me, and then I need you to say that it's done because I you know I'll say you know to a remote team say we're shooting remote and I'm hitting the the shutter from a screen share, um, and we have camera crew and camera on set, but I'm not there. If I say um, all right, can somebody powder you know for shine? Um, I'm just, I'm going to do the thing that I've always done, which is like, da, 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 waiting for the, you know, but I'm not looking at the makeup artist in my own space. So, you know, copy that and then I'm done. And then I'm like, oh, got it. I know to pay attention again. That's good. Let's check yeah. this out. You know, copy that. Got it. Um, you know, that's sort of open air. Like, I want you to tell me you heard me and you acknowledge me, <laughs> make me feel good, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot. Me. I, well, it's going, no, but, this is going great. <laughs> but then, you know, I'll go home, you know, or I'll be sitting, you know, it's something that's unnecessary. Like, I, I want a glass of water. Copy that. Like, I, now I can't stop saying copy that. Like, <laughs> you know, getting but a manicure. Basic stuff, basic stuff that, you know, if you implement it, it really makes your job a lot easier and everybody's job a lot easier. And, you know, it's something that I wanted to make sure everybody. Yeah, you know, that really stuck out to me when when we first talked about that. And yeah, I thought that was important. Yeah. Acknowledgement, it's good. Yeah. Nodding and and active participation. Nodding your head. I hear yes. you. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Changing gears a little bit. What are you doing, or what are you planning to do to keep a creative edge during this time? Oh. And that could be anything from adding new techniques, getting out of your comfort zone, making mm -hmm. some prints that you've been meaning to do. You know, just anything. Wow. Well, I'll start off. I mean, interestingly, <laughs> Netflix, you know, we've all been watching more Netflix and Amazon Prime or whatever movies we download. And I downloaded a movie, I think, or I didn't download, it was on Netflix about uh, Miles Davis, famous jazz musician. And it was a documentary about his life and his career. And in the middle of the movie, it was talking about how he took like two years before he became famous to find his sound, quote unquote. And you know, I think we've all been in our career long enough to kind of find our sound, but this downtime has kind of made me stretch even a little more to be like, okay, how can I take it to the next level? How can I do something even more creative or different than I've done before that'll make whatever I'm doing even more unique and maybe even more marketable in the business sense? Um, so, you know, I'm trying to find my sound even further or change it up, you know? Um, I think Michelangelo put it pretty well. Once you've actually done something and you put it out there, then the whole world's going to start copying it. So you've got to move on to the next thing. And so, you know, we're, we're constantly doing that for the entire length of our careers, but I think even more so right now to come out of this stronger, whenever that is. 
you know, I'm at least pushing in that level, testing new lighting techniques to see what we can come up with. You know, if I, if I uh, put any of your portfolios up on my screen and I start going through them, I feel as a viewer of your stuff and all three of you, I, 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 it seems to me that you found your sound and it's interesting to me that you're still looking for your sound, even though it's obvious to me as, as somebody who's looking at your stuff that, oh, that guy, yeah, I can tell that that guy shot that. You know, when you go through the whole thing, yeah. it's like, I see your sound, <laughs> but. Um, but it's yeah, constantly yeah, changing and evolving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. never the same. And we see it more maybe than you would see it from early days to now, how there's been a transition. It's still all of our style or however you want to say it, because we are who we are, mm-hmm. but we're constantly evolving our craft as much as we can. Sorry to take over so much there. No, I oh, thought that was no, a no, really, cool. that was such a beautiful analogy about finding your sound. Um, I'm, it, I kind of, I had to take pause for a second and just think about that. <laughs> that. Well, I mean, because these are the mediums, you know, I'm sure you guys get to, think about scoring and video and sound and um, Mm -hmm. as well, not just, you know, not just visuals, right? I think, I think this, I think this pause that we have with COVID is, you know, you you guys are all busy, I'm sure with clients uh, for COVID. I think this in some ways has kind of given us just (laughs) (laughs) a little um, bit. For for me personally, I just my my brain is always ticking for ideas. Um, most of them are terrible and useless, and I try them and will never ever see the light of day. I'm, I've shot <laughs> so many projects that no one will ever see because they're just junk. It sounds great in my head, and then we try it out and it just doesn't work. Um, but at least you learn. For me, it's all about learning. It's I I always try and find something that's going to motivate me to try something different, even if it doesn't work. Um, and someone asked me the other day, you know, why, why do you think your clients pick you as opposed to someone else? And I, for me, it's, it's the client is, they're paying for my mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. That's the way that I see it. They're paying for the hundreds of hours that I tried something and it didn't work. And then I finally got it, or I finally realized the better way of doing it, but I wouldn't have got there if it wasn't for those hours. So it's that constant journey of, you know, always trying to do something different. Like you said, Michael, you know, working on your personal projects. Yes, you've mm-hmm. got your clients and they need to, you need to do those to pay the bills. But at the same time, what, what really inspires you to be shooting? Uh, for me, it's variety. I, I, I don't want to be a one, one-stop shop. I want to be, I'm a photographer and I will shoot whatever I find interesting to capture, whether it's an aerial, whether it's a landscape, whether it's a product, whether it's um, this bug project that I've recently done or, or a car, it's, I want to apply whatever I'm learning, no matter what the subject is. So that's, that's how I try and always come up with something. Uh, what, what inspires me that I want to shoot? So that's my side. Sarah, you're up. No, well, it, I mean, listen, I have, I had 18 years of classical piano training, which is why I Whoa. type really fast. Um, but I can't, <laughs> I can't physically play the piano anymore. I think that's some sort of Pavlovian response. I literally cannot sit <laughs> at the keyboard and play, but I taught myself how to compose music for stop motion, which normally um, we've got people making music and we've, I get to collaborate with them on that, uh, that level. But I had to collaborate with myself and make music, which was totally crazy learning how to, mix the music, learning how to, you know, I, I, I enlisted the help of many amazing humans who uh, showed me how to do it. And then, am I going to be a professional composer? No. Was a lot of it very bad? Yes, it sounded a lot like 90s trance. I can't, I, I, whatever. That's, I want to hear that. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't, because it was- Make um, me a mixtape. <laughs> you are going to hate me after this, but- <laughs> about timing and execution of long form gifts and long form gifts meaning not a loop of five frames but say 50 yeah. to 100 to 200 frames and how to pace out that spacing it you know just like with anything you know I was a terrible dancer but at least I know how to you know find that timing really cool to right. learn how to make music and then think about gifting differently or even thinking about stills and video differently um that would that was really fun so and then also yeah. working with people that know way more than I do. That's been a lot, you know, learning again. How, when was the last time you guys learned, really learned something, you know? Last week. 
Thank you. Should be. <laughs> exactly. If I, to me, I hate, I hate the idea of standing still. It, it really bothers me. It makes me really antsy. If I'm not shooting, it makes me antsy. Yeah. If I'm not thinking of something that's going to go horribly wrong, it makes me antsy. So I, I, I need to feel like I'm on edge because as, as soon as I feel comfortable, that makes me think that something's wrong. Um, so <laughs> that's the way that I, that's the way that I approach my yeah. photography. I want to be, I always want to be sort of pushing what I can do. Um, and a lot of it's for myself, quite frankly, and, or, or I'm trying to learn something from a shoot that I'm going to apply six months from now or three months, whenever, whenever mm -hmm. that time arises, I just know that I have that toolbox that I can pull it out and say, I remember I did this shoot and it went horribly wrong, but this little bit worked and I'm going to use it for this. So it's just, you're just constantly building your toolbox is the way that I kind of see it. And the more variety, yeah. the more you're going to make more mistakes that you would make if you were just shooting one thing. So that's, that's yeah. my approach to it. Well, right. if you stop learning, then you stop having a career, I think, in this industry. Mm. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely pretty right. Quickly. I, can I quote you on that? Because I'm going sure. to. I'm going to quote you on that. That on a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're not going forward, those, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. But. Um, so changing gears a little bit. We discussed a lot of concepts here about, you know, coping with this work upheaval and how to turn lemons into lemonade. And, but since we're AZO, we do need to talk a little bit about monitors and calibration. So, um, oh, this, this was? talk to me, yeah, <laughs> how calibrated equipment like monitors and printers and, you know, other uh, equipment that you have uh, at your fingertips has made adapting to this new workflow a little more bearable. So, Calibrated monitors and other equipment, how, knowing that you've already been doing that going into this, how has that made uh, transitioning into this period a little more bearable for you? I don't know if it's made it more bearable. I just think it's just, it's just made my, my workflow so much easier to do because it's just one less thing to worry about. So it's, you know, knowing that my monitors are always calibrated once I've set the right settings, that, that my downstairs monitors are the same as my upstairs one, having the same calibration, the same color tones, it's just massively important. I don't have to worry about it. It's, just, it's automatically done. My, my, my retoucher has the same calibrated monitors, so we're looking at the exact same thing, and my printer has the exact same color profile as well. So it's just, it's just it's, it creates my workflow to be identical or as streamlined as possible across the board. Well, and Andre, so I don't know if it's made it more you, bearable. I was going to say, Andre, since you've had, you know, you, you and Michael are so dialed in as am I. Um, it was, there were a lot of unknowns, but color fidelity and matching across monitors and across teams was never the question. Like mm -hmm. yeah. people had a lot of questions to work while working remote, but these things we, we almost take for granted at yeah. this point that we have this That's completely I mean. dialed exactly. in scenario, right? Yeah, exactly. And for me, I mean, I sell prints. I mean, I definitely get hired and I've had clients tell me, you know, part of, you know, we like your style, we like what you do, but we also know we're going to get a solid image file from you or, mm -hmm. you know, the colors are going to be dead on. It's going to print well. Mm -hmm. We can use it online and in print brochures and we won't have any issues. So apparently they've had yeah. issues with other photographers in the past when they tell me those kind of things, but you know, it's, and I think I put this in my little PDF at the beginning. I view the monitor as more important than the camera almost. If we're going to be really crazy about color, which we should be as photographers, you know, what you're looking at and tuning your images up is we're not doing it by the numbers. It's not paint by the numbers. We have to do it visually. So that is yeah. the only interface you have with accurate color, um, you know, in addition to the camera and of course like a, a gray card or some kind of um, color chart that you're using to dial in the colors for makeup and stuff, I'm guessing. Exactly. I mean, and I've been yeah. told that this, that this lip is vibrating out of the Zoom <laughs> call and into the universe. Um, and that is not color correct, okay? Let me just tell you right now. It's a very mellow orangey red, okay? Um, but I mean, it, it's always Zoom. Yeah, we'll blame Zoom. But, you know, for me, especially, um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of, there's a lot of choices that you can make when you're shooting, especially beauty. Um, but if the client's product doesn't read true, 
and you know, mm -hmm. that, that's unacceptable. So destroys the product. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and also makes people unhappy. So, you know, having that perfect color calibrated workflow is, it's, I mean, it's never been, it's, it, it's never been more important as it is now when, if you're talking to somebody who absolutely cannot see the colors that you're seeing and you say, I promise you, it matches exactly the swipe that was in person mm -hmm. on set. Yeah. And there even is, for I portraits, we'll, it allows you to here, take uh, things. Oh, with, sorry. Uh, they have ASO monitors or calibrated monitors. Um, say that again? Are some of your clients also viewing your work on calibrated monitors? Do you uh, ensure that? We, um, we are planning on implementing that moving okay. forward, especially with clients that have, um, have, have the high problems. need, you know, high, mm -hmm. highly defined needs for color fidelity. Um, we've been talking about that because I think it's a really great option to offer somebody and say, you know what, how about not, I'll never have to say, trust me, it looks great. I, I never want to say that. <laughs> no you yeah. actually will see that it looks great. You know? And I think that a lot of clients are really amenable to that. They're interested. They say, oh wait, I can see what you see. And I say, yeah. And they said, do I have to know how to set it up? I said, no, <laughs> just leave it, yeah. leave it to me. These are the numbers, plug them in and it'll work all the time. I, I think for me as well, because I do, same as, um, same as Michael, I print uh, a great deal of my work. Having a consistent monitor, not only in my studio, but also with my retouch, also with my printer, that learning curve for me at the beginning was really um, quite steep in terms of making sure that everything is exactly the same, having the same color profile. I went so many times to a previous printer that didn't have a properly mm -hmm. calibrated monitor where I would have to drive to them to, they would print a test strip, I'd have to drive to them, and the, the blue was completely different. I mean, it's supposed to be this Bora Bora beautiful light blue and it would come as this dark, muddy kind of blue. I, I can't send that to the client. There's just no way my, my, my reputation would get destroyed. So I think that it's, it's really for me about not only being incredibly accurate, given the equipment that I have, I shoot phase one, 150 megapixels, 16 bit color, that I need a monitor that can keep up with that. Um, that then can, those files can live in the exact same format across the whole board. So that to me is what cru what's crucial is just that consistency across the board. But Michael and Andre, once you guys got it dialed in, you kind of, it, you don't have to keep guessing. It's done, right? You're just done. Exa that, but that's exa exactly, exactly right. I mean, they have my profile that I have on my screen here at the printer, same as my retoucher. So I know when we're talking about that red, I know it's going to be that exact red all the way across Not the board. Not this red. Not that one. That really is vibrant. It's the same as the leave button. You could just press my lip and then the poof, the will go away. <laughs> Radiating. Radiating. So, so we're at the end of, of the topics that we set out and uh, we do have a few questions. So um, we'd like to ask a few of those of you all and some of them specifically. Um, I will start with Let's Has it really been an hour already? Oh my God. Yeah, I know, but we could, we, we, the three of us could talk for hours. I know. Yeah, oh, we, we've done that. <laughs> I know. But are we, um, is this uh, 90 minutes or is it 75? What, what's the total time on this? I forget. Let's just keep going yeah. until they cut us off. <laughs> well, I can't wait I to hear the was... questions. I think they'll be neat. All right, so. <laughs> what do we got? Um, Jim asks Sarah. Oh gosh. What resolution monitor are you shooting the images off of? And how do you communicate how you want to light the model? Ooh, okay. Well, so there's a couple of factors involved in doing a remote shoot where you're shooting where, and I'll just, let's go back for a second because it's much easier with a audio visual aid. Okay, if you are in the black, hot, sweaty box and you are shooting <laughs> with no, um, there's, there's no ambient light, okay? You train your camera, we're shooting um, high resolution phase one digital. Um, and you're shooting square onto your monitor, okay? Really important. And, um, you know, it does, it, 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 it's very nice and very important to have a very nice monitor. And I'm gonna actually let, Matthew, can you wanna speak really briefly about, we were testing lots of different monitors and I think that we found out that the best one was the CG319X for this. Um, you play with the distance from the screen, you pay, play with the uh, focal length of your lens, 
your shutter speed and your f-stop are very important. Um, keeping your ISO not too high because of noise factor. Um, and how do you light the subject? Well, in this particular case, I'm incredibly lucky because Helen has an entire setup of home at home of, of great lighting um, and she knows how to use it. And that was incredibly helpful because I say, hey, can you do this and this and this? And she actually, the, that wall, she has walls painted in her house that are colors to do just Oh, those this, aren't backdrops? Is, no. Oh, it looks, it looks like a, Looks I know. Like regular no, no, I, it's pretty, pretty cool. it's pretty amazing. This is a painted wall and she was amazing. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and we, we had a really great time. I mean, being able to direct her though, and that's, that's what's interesting because we have this, you know, zoom style call um, and there's a delay. So that's also interesting because I would ask her to do something that would happen in the past. And it was so meta that we'd get confused. I said, you know, can you, can you, uh, can you look in the screen? You know, can you look in the, in the camera that she had, that had happened in the past? I'm like, that's great. Hold on, do it again. So, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it, and you know what, there's, um, there was a lot of laughing. I'm not going to lie. There was, there's a lot of laughing, but then again, if it's not joyous on set, then I don't want to be a part exactly. of it anyways. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, hopefully I, I answered that. that question properly. <laughs> um, I, I hope I got this one right. This one's for everyone. So everyone gets a chance to participate here. Uh, Rahelio asks, when you are shooting without monitors and it's all about the flickering moments, how do you know you have the right shot? So when you're not shooting with a monitor, how do you know you have the right shot? Is that in general? Experience? In general, yes. Mm. You know, I'll, I'll take this one really quick. I think it just depends. Sometimes it's complete luck. Uh, that you just get something that is better than what you even realize. Um, a lot of times it's long planning and it comes out the way that it, that you want it to be, but sometimes it's the complete opposite. It really just, uh, for me, it's just experience. I just know that if I use these settings in this light that I have with this kind of composition, with this kind of focal length, I'm going to get roughly what I'm looking for. So I think understanding your gear and your lenses and your focal lengths and how it's going to look in your mind before you take it, is it is it a, you'll be able to capture some of those moments that you know are fleeting like you like you suggested but mm -hmm. that's my take i mean and it I depends on what you're shooting too i shoot untethered 99.9 .9 of the time so um it is experience like andre is saying you know your equipment you know what it's capable mm -hmm. of you know i mean for me especially you know how good the autofocus is or isn't for certain subjects and for a lot of the stuff i do the shot is set up, it's thought through. It's not like I just walk out there like a photojournalist and I'm just blasting away without any thinking. You know, we've really thought through the shot. We know what we're trying to get. And then we have multiple attempts to get that. It's not like, right. Right. You know, it depends on the scenario. Maybe it's only gonna happen once, but if it's only gonna happen once, then we think through it 10 times longer to make sure we get what we want. You know, and we do have an LCD on the back of the camera. I'm not really worried about color at the time of capture. You know, I'm shooting raw. I have the white balance adjusted as close as we can get it, you know, on the location to whatever the best settings are. We're trying to capture the data and then we'll worry about massaging it when we get back to the, you know, to the office. Um, and that comes down to experience. It comes down to experimentation. It also comes down to working with the person you're working with or the people you're working with, you know, yep. so that they know what they're going to do and I know what they're going to do and we all you know, set it up and get to the right spot. So complicated answer for a fairly simple question. Well, no, I mean, but isn't, but isn't that's, it's not necessarily a simple question because I think that um, yeah. when you're talking about finding your sound, right? Finding the sound, finding the voice. Mm -hmm. And I tell a lot of um, young photographers, like, you know, the happy accident, what you don't know, all the mistakes that you make and all of the trial and error that goes into your finding your voice or sound. Um, mm -hmm. is so important because it informs who you will be in the future. And then with the oh. idea that you could throw it out entirely and start over and reinvent yourself if you want to. But that in my life of shooting, you know, I, I really, you know, okay, I, I've probably mentioned it 10 times now, but I wanted to be a ballerina. That was a failure, right? I wanted to be a, uh, I wanted, God, I wanted to be a ballerina. But <laughs> um, the opportunity of shooting people jumping over and over and over again. There is a point in the middle of a jump with a human that is not mm -hmm. on a trampoline. Trampoline, you know, kind of, you're, you're breaking the rules a little bit in terms of gravity, but jumping, 
where you're actually stopped that apex of the moment where you're, I mean, mm -hmm. if we could slow it down matrix style, right? And you just see somebody hovering for a second, there is a right moment and a wrong moment for that jump. Right. But what I had to unlearn from all of my years of ballet training was that sometimes the happy accident and getting it at the wrong moment is actually a better photograph than the perfect photograph, right? Indeed, yeah. Yeah, and it depends. And again, like you said, I think that's that's also really crucial. It depends on your subject. There's one yes. thing, for, again, from from my perspective, there's one thing for me to be circling around the spot in a helicopter or a plane doing a corkscrew. That is, you know, my my environment is constantly changing. I have no control over that really. I mean, it can mm -hmm. slow down the helicopter or the plane, but what I'm seeing below is changing because my position around the sun is constantly changing. So I have to adjust my settings all the time. I may miss something and I, and I have, I still regret some shots that I just didn't take and it sucks and I can never go back to them in that exact place in that exact way. And it's just, it, it just kind of is what it is. Whereas opposed to being in a studio, super controlled environment, you can control mm -hmm. your lights, you can slow down, you can be tethered, you can see very quickly what your, what your, your results are. Whereas in a helicopter, I don't check my work. I just know my, I have to trust my settings. I have to trust my technique mm -hmm. and it's very instinctive. So I, I really like that sort of difference in style and, and speed of shooting. Um, I, I kind of find it refreshing. That's why I like doing aerial, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. It just keeps you on your toes. It doesn't, doesn't allow you to take your time. So it, it really varies. And Sarah definitely made a great point because, I mean, I have a good example of this, which is similar to what you were just talking about, Andre. I was shooting at Jaws, which is one of the biggest waves in the world off the coast of Maui. And I think I showed a picture from there, but the picture I showed earlier wasn't the best picture. I shot 9,000 pictures that day sitting on the back of a yeah. jet ski Very going easy, yeah. up and over the shoulder of every 70 foot wave. And the best picture was from right after I got out there and I, wasn't even holding the camera to my eye and it doesn't even have a surfer on the way. It was an empty wave that rolled by that was giant. And I knew it looked cool. I just pointed the camera and blasted, mm -hmm. knowing the autofocus would catch it. And you well, know- I mean, not the most frustrating experience. <laughs> when you actually realize that, like I've spent all this time to plan it properly. And I like, look through my 9,000 images. I've done the same, I've shot thousands. And then you like, the one that I didn't care about that I was like, oh, let's just take a last second. That's the one well, that's- Do you remember, I mean, this, uh, from, from a different technology, do you remember the concept of the perfect Polaroid, right? Um, oh, and not yeah. being able to repeat nope. that? Yeah, <laughs> no, that. no. <laughs> um, but, you know- I was always digital. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I remember you those know, days, yeah. You couldn't that recreate shot the Polaroid. That you, exactly, so the shot the that you never- client was going crazy. That Sorry. shot that you can't anticipate, the shot that it may not be the best moment, but it is the moment, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, Michael and Andre, I will say that um, the best answer also to the question is you can take 9,000 pictures, but it's in the edit where the truth comes yep. out, right? Yep. So, yes. pick, knowing how to and, find, and pick the perfect photo. And, and to that point, further still, it depends on the work that you select that you think is the best out of 9,000. I never delete any of my work unless it's completely out of focus and it, I can never pull it back. But I have all my work from 10, 15 years ago because every now and again, I wanna go back to see mm -hmm. how my technique is adjusted, the mistakes I was making back then, what am I learning, what am I doing? But then I look through some of the work and I go, wow, that's actually a really good image that 10 years mm -hmm. ago, I was like, no way, I'm not using that. So from the 9,000 you chose, you are just presenting the ones that you think are the best right now. But you can go back six months from now and you go, holy crap, that actual other image is way better. It has a different feel. It speaks to me in a different way. So um, yeah, don't delete your work, peeps. Ever, oh my God, don't ever delete <laughs> Ever, <work>. that's <laughs> why you need hard drives. And that's another conversation. Lots of them. <laughs> Lots of hard drives. That was a good question, obviously. Yeah, it was a nice I know, question. that took like 20 minutes for us to answer. I know, but it was a good one. <laughs> Our next question is from Brooke, who asks Sarah, was it harder or easier to get what you needed out of a model with them being remote? Are they more or less inhibited? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, gosh, I could have a model who's um, right in the studio with me who could be shy or having a bad day or maybe I'm not communicating. You know, there, there are so many reasons why being, um, being 
in the actual space with somebody it could change. But I, you know, I mean, being in, in, if the model's in their own home and they know exactly where they are, does it change? I think that there's, um, the thing that doesn't change about the experience for myself with talent is that I never approach um, the communication the same way twice, whether or not it was remote or in person. Um, so I'm, and I always strive to make everybody feel as comfortable as possible, even if they aren't, you know, even if, even if there's a language barrier or even if, yeah. you know, you know, even if somebody's having not the best day. Great, thank you. Um, got one from Eva who asks for everyone, um, when it comes to pitching or bidding for commercial clients and advertisements, do you have any tips or tricks on how to win a bid? Yeah. So are you, are you bidding and do you have uh, any uh, insight on how to win that one? Let your agents wow, so do it. Factors there. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a loaded question. <laughs> Just one. That's all we need is one. <laughs> I would say more than anything, know know the references and know your product. If you're, I'm yep. going to go back to lipstick. Yep. If you're if you're um, bidding on something, you know you want to be an expert. And if you didn't know anything about mm -hmm. um, a whipping cream before and suddenly you're bidding on whipping cream, well, you should become an absolute expert, which means at the end of your career, you know too much about way too many things, right? <laughs> um, which is lots of fun. But I would say that the most important um, piece of advice that I ever give anybody is don't be afraid to share information. You don't have secrets. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to really share, even if you don't get the job, the opportunity to, um, to to just express yourself, you know, I always, I always have some sort of hidden tip, trip, blah, hidden trick or tip on a certain type of shoot, and I'm not afraid to tell exactly how I would do it. Um, and if you like me, then you'll hire me. And if there's somebody better for the job, then maybe you'll take that and you'll make your shoot better with that tip. But that's, trip. but that's really rare. From what I've found with with a lot of photographers, and and again, going back to COVID, especially now. Right. I mean, I know I have so many of my friends that may not even make it out of COVID. They're, they were struggling to begin with at the best of times. And now COVID is just going to put a complete dampener on it. So many people are withholding that information. They're worried about giving their secrets because you're just going to take it and you're going to get the job. I'm, I 100% I agree with you, Sarah. I think it's, it's the only way that we can all progress if we share as much as we can. Um, and that's, and going back to what you were also saying about learning about your product, that's in terms of bidding, understand that market of that yeah. yogurt or whatever you're shooting. What, what have been the bids before? Who shot it previously? How did it look? What, try and find out, you know, what was that job all about? Did it entail a lot of people? Was it, was it a massive production? Can you do it on a smaller scale? And again, I think a lot of these companies that are still on the fence about spending a lot of money on, on, on big production shoots right now, they want it done on a smaller scale. So given the environment, try and get it done as efficiently as you can, because it's only going to keep the cost down of your overall production. But it's tough times. It's, it's really, even speaking to my agents about it, trying to sort of, Hey, you guys have your ear on the ground a little bit more than I do. What's, what's happening. And it's just all over the place. People it's, it's, it's kind of bouncing between extremes and it's, um, it, it's, it's tough to, nail it down and adding on to that i mean sarah said it there's no secrets there's so many factors to this question in terms of how you get a job that i don't even know that i know all the factors when i get a job half the time but i do know that if you show you know say it's an estimate for a big advertising job like was asked you know you want it's to show dairy the client, product because we're only talking about dairy products a whipping right cream okay yeah. great yogurt. Um, so, you know, you've got to be an expert, like Sarah said, but also bend over backwards to give the client the best possible estimate that's the best as well thought through as possible. I mean, if they're asking you to bid on this project, then they, you know, you would assume that they're thinking, well, you can pull this off. Um, and then they're picking whoever has the best number, the magic number in terms of the total price, um, but they're also looking at the creative side and how well you've thought through the project to actually solve the problems they're trying to solve in terms of creating whatever they're trying to create. Um, and maybe you can bring and, and some creativity to it that's beyond what they were even thinking. 
Um, yeah, and, and one more thing, just to further add to that, I think for me, relationship building with clients is really crucial. I never see a job as yeah. just, I want to shoot just one job, I'm going to bid really high, and I'll, maybe I'll get it, and then I'll shoot it, and then I'll never work mm -hmm. with them again. For me, in some ways, I'd rather, I'm more okay to take slightly less money for a particular job, but knowing that we can enter that sort of continued relationship where they they come to you for the creative vision that you have on an ongoing basis. So it, yeah. it really depends on how you want to establish your relationship with your clients, which is going to affect your bidding. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're done on that one. <laughs> you one, for you all. one. One word answers on this one. Okay. What brand of printer do you use? Epson. 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 <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Canon makes um, great printers too. I've had Canon as well, but so far. Well, they've improved Epson. massively in the last few years, I feel. Um, but Epson, I believe, is still quite far away. And when it comes to paper, I don't know if someone's asking about paper as well. I'm, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the the Hammer Mueller, uh, Hammer Mueller Pearl, and uh, I believe the 330. Isn't it the 330? The 330 Heavy, whatever it's called. But Hammer Mueller to me is the best quality paper for printing. Great. How about this one for all, all of you? Are you still using producers? Absolutely. Yes. I yes. love, I, I love producers. I love production. I love spreadsheets. I love somebody telling me. I hate you, spreadsheets. I love, I'll do your spreadsheets that's for from you. My, I, I no, that's from my banking days. I am not touching a spreadsheet. I love a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, but no I think that. No macros. Producers are, um, are, are just one more, um, fantastic human to collaborate with on your set, for sure. For me, it depends on the job. If for bigger jobs, yeah. there's definitely yeah. producers. For smaller jobs, we're producing it in-house. Somebody's always producing it, it's just a matter of who. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, and honestly in the industry these days, in reference to that last question in terms of bidding and stuff, the producer is your best friend because they know what the mm -hmm. prices mm -hmm. are, who's getting yep. what these days, and that's yeah, how you contact. get it. That's how you get the big jobs is you have a producer who knows the industry and can actually answer, am I charging way too much or way too little or what else do we need? Um, um, I forgot to and mention- they have, the, And they have the license. connections. Oh, sorry about that. Go ahead. I, Indeed. I talked all over. No, sorry. I, they, they have the connections within the industry that will take you years to be able to achieve. So if you, if you work with a good producer, they'll, they'll know just from the most complicated things to the most basics, basics you know, who's got the best food food for the job because you're shooting at midnight somewhere. Like who's going to be the best one to bring food, for example, or who's got the best connections for a sound tech, you know, even if you don't know them, they, they will have those contacts. So I, I definitely agree. I agree on the size of the job too. I've produced a lot of my, all my, all my failed shoots. I've produced. <laughs> <laughs> I think we only have 10 minutes left in our session, but, um, we're going to end it with a, probably a question that uh, will probably take more than 10 minutes to answer. A stumper. <laughs> Keep yeah. in mind. Okay. Um, I should do a one word, one word answer. One word answer. Let's, let's go back. We're, we're going to take you back to your early days. As a oh, photographer. God, no. Oh, yes. How was your first hired or paid gig um, project? How did you get it? How was it? How did you get it? And how important was that first paying gig to your career? So it's all about your first paying gig. How did you get it? And how important was it? God. I know. So I we're I different training between like the first images we licensed and got paid for or our first I assignment? Know. Your first yeah. assignment that you're getting paid to do, I think. Okay. Well, it's an easy answer for me because I'm in an, well, I started out as an adventure sports photographer, very core to that world. And it's very easy to see who the clients are. They're all the manufacturers of the gear. So, you know, it was me hustling to go out and talk to all those people that made the gear for the, for climbing essentially. Um, and for me, it was Patagonia, the clothing company. Yeah. Um, nice. and it was me contacting them, showing them some of my work and then going out and producing more of it for them. Um, and so it was, it was very important scholar. to your career, it sounds like. <laughs> well, yeah, it was like without that, I wouldn't have a career because I would have like gave up right there. 
Um, you know, I was licensing images for a number of years before that. Like I think we probably all do when we start out. It's not like we just jump into this world and get assignments because nobody's going to mm -hmm. give you an assignment right at the beginning. Um, so you have to produce your own work for a certain period of time to show what you're capable of. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a longer answer than. My first job was for a thousand lamps for Tashin. Is it Tashin or Tashin? Because I'm going to say it wrong and I want somebody to tell me. I, think it's I don't know. Well, I'm, I think it's Tashin, but okay. I'm British. So I put a well, slang it. Was, it. So, but we're not going to count that because now I can't even look at a lamp without cringing. So um, I would say, <laughs> the, because what's more important is that the, the actual pivotal job for me was um, a project for a, a duo called Prince a Schooler. And that fashion duo, um, I met every single person that is important in my life today started from that actual shoot. It's like a family tree. I can see it. That's um, awesome. That's very rare, but yeah. that's awesome. And, and because I, I walked on set and somebody said to me, hey, do you want to shoot makeup? And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, it's, well, when you shoot makeup, it means you shoot and it looks nice. And um, it, you know, he had lots of really great things to say about it. And I was like, that sounds cool. Okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, happy, happy happenstance right there. Nice. I think, I think I got really lucky. My, it started through a license. I think I got, amazingly enough, in a Nat Geo book. <laughs> it nice. was one of their top thousand, I don't know, whatever, top thousand favorite image, landscape images or something. And I, my, one of my images was licensed and um, I got paid absolutely nothing for it, as, as you, can, you can expect. Um, cause that's how they do it. But, um, I, I think it goes both ways. I mean, I still, I don't know about you guys, but I still pitch to clients constantly myself. I have my agents do that on my behalf as well, but if there's something that's a little bit more out there, I'll be the first one to, to send out my work and say that, Hey, I have this idea in mind. I have this project. Perfect. Like I mentioned to you guys beforehand, when we were off the air, shooting the Griffith observatory to shoot the moon and the planets using their telescope. Like I, I reached out to them and I said, Hey, I have this crazy idea. It's, I don't know if it's been done before through a telescope. Do you want to give it a go? And they said, yeah, that sounds great. So I send out hundreds of emails a week to random people and kind of see what sticks. But again, that goes back to sort of my, my notion of, I want to keep trying different things uh, and see what, see what works and what doesn't work. But, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I've got off topic on that one. But basically what I'm saying is just send out your work as much as you can. Trust in, trust in your ability to be able to create something different. And it's some, something's going to stick. But it might take a long time because I've been, I've been told no more times than I can remember. But just keep at it. Yeah, but doesn't no make you want to try harder? Doesn't no oh, it drives make you me think insane. It <laughs> It, it's like I see it and I'm like oh I'm gonna show um, you I'm gonna do something amazing and you're gonna come back and say yeah I should have I should have said yes but that's just my my tennis personality mm -hmm. coming through oh and that's how we all built a career because you just have to be okay with getting told no because that's gonna be 90 percent of the answers and if yeah, you don't have that tenacity that. then you're not you know gonna make it um, and it just makes those want those few projects that do come through that much more sort of unique mm -hmm. and special because uh, it just gives you that ability to then show to other people what your vision is or was mm -hmm. or what your project idea was. So, um, yeah, that, that was tough to swallow, being told no so many times at the beginning of my career. Like, that, that, was, that was tough. I mean, it does take a hit on you, but you got yeah. you got to keep plugging at it. Game personality. As you, as you move to <laughs> being, uh, you know, from, from what you were doing before to being a photographer full-time um, and thinking, well, maybe I, you know, if these people keep telling me I don't have it, maybe I'll, you know, head back to doing what I was doing before kind of thing. And, um, no, no, I, I tend to going down the phot photography path. is so much more fun. As an Aquarius that tends to be all over the place constantly. Cause that's just how I am. Um, the one thing I, I'm very driven. If I pick something, I will stick, stick to it kind of to the death in a sense until I really make up my mind and say no. Um, so I started out as a professional tennis player tra traveling around the world and I did investment banking in New York. So whatever I've stuck to, I've really put everything in it. Um, and I've been beaten up plenty of times as a result of it. But uh, this is this is what I've always wanted to do. And it just I just never knew it. Being surrounded by six monitors 
when when we were on the trading desks uh, was pretty brutal. So now I just have different monitors. Now I have ISO monitors. Mm -hmm. Nice and colorful. So it's beautiful. A little bit more colorful. Except for, those, images except for those damn spreadsheets. <laughs> I love a spreadsheet. I hate spreadsheets. I'm not doing Excel. If I don't see Excel for the rest of my life, I am perfectly fine. Oh, let me know if you can get away with that because I don't know how that's going to happen. I, I have to find a minion to do it because I can't, I will not put up with doing macros. I still don't. I forgot all the macros purposely. As soon as I quit banking, I'm like, I don't ever want to do a macro ever. Understood. I think we're uh, at the end of our time now, everyone. And I do want to thank Sarah and Michael and Andre so much for helping us, uh, especially us newbies on doing webinars. This is our first webinar. Oh, hardly. Yeah, us. you guys did a great Yay. job. There we go. We can give a yeah, clap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did want to pass that along to you as well as uh, just to let everybody know we're, we're A's up, like that sign says up there, um, or my shirt, A's up. Um, so if you're interested in uh, color accurate self-calibrating monitors, come on over and see us. And uh, as well, if uh, you know, I'm sure our, our panelists would be glad to hear from anybody who's joined on this. Uh, if you have specific questions you want to ask of them. I'm sure they have yeah. ways for, uh, for you to get a hold of them. Well, I'm sure you're going to put up our work and our website. So if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm sure we're all more than happy to, to get on the phone and answer them or email or wh whatever it is. And I know there's some more Color Edge Mastermind webinars coming up. So keep an eye out for those. Yes, thank you for that. And I think uh, that ought to do it. So thank you so much. And uh, cool. Hey, we thank you. We really love yeah, being a part Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And meeting Michael and Andre remote. Yes, all that technology. <laughs> but um, this has been a fantastic experience to connect with people that I would never be in the same set with ever, which is yeah, amazing. Absolutely. I mean, I learned a lot from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, well, ditto, same again. So appreciate it. Thank you. See everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Matthew. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.